When you hear the word lighting, most photographers are going to think about adding one light to a scene. Some of us might think about adding two or three lights, but most of us aren't going to think about a key aspect of lighting, and that's because for many of us, this might not seem like lighting at all. That's probably because when it's there, it might go unnoticed, and when it's missing, it might not be identifiable. And this missing element is what's holding many photographers back from doing well in competitions, enjoying the look of a print for their wall, or feeling like there's a level of refinement that they just can't achieve. But for most of us, it's hard to put a finger on exactly what this is. In this video today, we're going to explore all of the ways that you can remedy this mystery problem and review what choices you might consider to improve your images. A photographer asked me to critique his work, and when I looked over his photos, his faces were well illuminated, his subjects were separated from the background through a combination of edge lights and hair lights, and background lights. But the shadow details were missing. Where did they go? While this can be a style choice, it might often not be on purpose. Sure, you might want to maximize the drama with hard light for a beauty shot or while using an optical snoot to project a sharp pattern. But oftentimes, an image will be elevated if the viewer can see a range of tones similar to the tones that we see with our own eyes. And speaking of eyes, let's think of it this way. If you were a makeup artist, it wouldn't matter how good you were at making or uh, applying eyeshadow if the foundation was too light or the wrong color. The shadows are our foundation. During my critique, I suggested that the photographer could use bounce cards, reflectors, or even an extra light to illuminate his shadows ever so slightly in order to maximize details. This is something I used to struggle with from time to time, mostly when shooting in a new studio or on location, or perhaps when everything on set was dark. But over the years, I've learned how to diagnose what's wrong, and then I will administer the right solution. Every shoot possesses its own set of problems, but if you understand the following basic concepts, you'll be able to maximize details in your depictions, no matter where you are or what tools you have at your disposal. Passive fill is probably the easiest way you can take charge of your shadows. Reflectors, white poster boards, V-flats, walls, or a huge 8x8 silk are going to be your friends. You can use anything as your fill source that is white-ish to bounce light, and it doesn't matter how professional or DIY it is as long as it doesn't have a color tint. Because if it does have a color tint to it, your images are going to have a color cast, and that could create its own problem. Just place your fill source on the opposite side of your main source, and you're in business. This will hold detail and blend the transition areas from light to dark. It might possibly make the main light appear less harsh as well. If you're using a mirror or a shiny piece of metal as your bounce source, then you'll have to precisely aim it in relation to the subject in order to get the optimal amount of fill. But more likely than not, you're not going to be using, but you're not going to be using something that's really shiny like that. You're going to be using something white, like a V-flat or a foam board. And its angle won't really matter that much because it's going to reflect light in all directions unlike that mirror or that piece of shiny material. This diagram shows the basic setup for passive fill. The closer the fill source is to the subject, the brighter the fill will be. This is a function of the inverse square law. A larger passive fill source will also have a bigger impact on the shadows than a smaller fill source that's placed in the same location. If the larger source is farther away than the smaller source, then it will only have a larger impact on the shadows if it takes up more of your subject's field of view than the smaller source did. This concept might seem familiar to you because it's based on the same principles that cause a larger light source relative to your subject to be a softer light source. Silver and gold reflectors, on the other hand, will add a different character to your lighting. The former will give you a lot more punch than a white bounce source, and the latter will warm up your image quite significantly while also giving it sort of that shiny feel. In general, I like to start with a one to four ratio between my main light or my key 
and my shadows when metered with a light meter on the subject's body or face. It's really important when you're using a meter that you have that meter placed really close to the subject because you're gonna get a much more accurate reading than if you have it closer to the light. That's gonna throw you off all the time. So keep it uh, close and that way these numbers will actually mean something. So in this example, or the way that I like to do things usually, is if my key meters at F8, then I want the shadows to meter at F4. To accomplish this with passive fill, I will move the bounce closer or I'll make it larger and I, if I want it to be brighter or I'll move it further away if I want it to get darker, if I want it to be less effective at filling in those shadows. Now, if you don't have a meter, you could just take a series of test frames until it looks right to you. Ultimately, that is what I do. However, I would still urge you, if you're just starting out, to get a light meter. That way, it will help you get a baseline understanding of where you might want to place your light, or I mean your fill source, and how bright you might want your shadows to look. Knowing the brightness of your key and your fill, fill scientifically will also help you if you ever have to create the same light in a different environment. So if you're a headshot photographer, for instance, and you get hired by a law firm to photograph different attorneys in different offices, you're gonna need to know exactly how you lit it in order to recreate the same headshot for different people in different cities or suburbs, that sort of thing. But remember, there are no wrong answers, except for if you have to make those lawyer photos look the same from location to location. Um, in general, when you're using fill, you may want the, the shadows to be darker or brighter than a one to four ratio, and that's okay. So now I'm gonna demonstrate for you passive fill. I'm here with my model friend, Jason, and I'm gonna be using an Ellen Chrome 100 centimeter deep octobox with an Ellen Chrome 5 inside. I'm gonna to link to all the gear down in the description. If you could check it out and click on those links, I would really appreciate it. That way I'll make a small amount of money and that'll help support me as I make more content like this. So I'm gonna go ahead and take some photos with just the light and Jason and no fill source whatsoever. And then we'll try some fill a little bit later on. All right. And so as you can see in this photo, there's really no detail in the shadows and that's because there's nothing over here for the main light to bounce off of. Maybe the brick wall, maybe the floor, maybe the ceiling, but it's really not gonna cause any light or a substantial amount of light to come back into the shadows on the shadow side. And so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna bring out a V-flat so we can see what it would look like if we just add a little bit of passive fill. Maybe have your hands up here or something, play with your cufflinks or, yeah. Keep the uh, head straight on though, yeah. Okay. Perfect. Okay. All right, I think that looked pretty good. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna open it up so that I even get more fill than I was getting with it in this position. When you open the V-flat up fully, there are two things you wanna keep in mind. The first one is you wanna open it up and then you wanna have it in a position where it takes up more of the model's field of view than it did when it was closed. Oftentimes when you're opening it up, you might have to move it back a little. And when you move it back, if it then looks smaller or the same size to the model, you're not gonna get any more bounce off of it. So that's a one thing to keep in mind. The second thing to keep in mind is when you do open it up, you need to make sure that your main light is bouncing off of both surfaces or the both sides of the V-flat because if it's only bouncing off one, it's not gonna make any difference uh, than just having it closed like it is now. Okay, that looks better. When shooting outdoors, you can use ambient light as your fill and just a single flash as your main light. Just set the exposure on your camera so that without flash, the image would be slightly underexposed. And then you then add your flash in until you get a proper exposure. You're just gonna turn the brightness up or down until it looks right on the back of the camera. The more you underexpose the scene, the darker your background will be and the less fill 
that you're get, gonna get in that final image. My general strategy when shooting outdoors is to use the sun as my hair or edge light and then light the subject's face with a softbox that is about a stop brighter than the light striking the subject from behind. You could determine this exposure by taking test photos that are front lit, just, you know, turning around behind you and then adjusting the, the exposure until they're slightly underexposed. Then you could turn back towards your subject and, um, and see if it looks right to you. You could also just frame your shot and take a series of test images until you get the right background brightness and then adjust your light until you get the right brightness on the person's face. It really isn't that hard. It's just more important that you understand the principles of what you're looking for and how you can work to achieve the lighting that you want. The ambient light will be the perfect fill most of the time outside. And when you're using a light and you've got the sun as your hair light, so just keep that in mind. And the sun's also gonna separate your subject from the background. But if you have a light meter, just keep in mind that those light meter numbers are going to be the starting point and you'll have to adjust on the fly to match your taste or maybe the subject's hair color or the brightness of the environment behind your subject as well. I've heard a lot of photographers say that they use a large light source behind them in the studio to own the shadows. Using flash in a light source behind you gives you total control over the brightness of your shadows, which is why I like to call it active fill. You control the power of the fill just as you control the power of all of the other lights in your setup. Oftentimes this fill light is about one quarter as bright as the key, two stops down, or that one to four ratio once again. But you really have to look at it on the back of the camera or on a monitor if you're tethering and decide if you want more or less power. If you took a photo with just the fill light turned on, it would probably look quite dim. But what matters is that the final image is a combination of the fill light and the main light together. Both of those added together will equal the brightness usually of your shadows and your overall environment that the subject's in. If the fill source is large or close relative to your subject, you can get large catch lights as well. If it's farther away or just plain small, it can create pinpoint reflections in their eyes, which might be distracting, and you could remove these in post. Active fill doesn't always have to be behind you. On location or in a studio, you can bounce light off of a white ceiling or a wall in order to fill your scene. A gray wall or ceiling will work well. It's just, once again, you want to avoid those colored surfaces because colored surfaces will reflect colored light, and that's going to cause a problem. I might also place a large softbox on the shadow side of my subject if I know having one behind me isn't practical because people are standing around like clients and blocking it, or there's inadequate space to put one back there. Using a large source like this up close is also passive fill because it will reflect light from your other modifiers into your shadows too. So just know that whenever you're using a number of softboxes on set, that light that you're projecting out of each one is going to bounce off of all of the white surfaces and come back into the shadows. So if you're having trouble sometime and you want your shadows to be dimmer, but you just can't figure out what's going on, it's probably those white surfaces, or it could just be that the room has too many white surfaces in it. And so the strategy we'd use to lessen the fill in this case would be to put black fabric down or use the black V flat, um, the black side of a V flat in order to block light from reflecting off of these other surfaces. In fact, I have a video that's all about uh, V flats and what they like to call negative fill. And if you should probably check that out and that'll help you sort of understand uh, this concept as well a little bit better. You can also boom your active fill over your subject, which creates shadows and highlights in your shadows, adding an overall layer of complexity to your images. You can spot this type of fill if you look at the top sides of the objects in your frame that aren't illuminated by the main lights beam.
I sometimes like to place an active fill source behind my main light that in effect creates a gradient of exposure while maintaining the same shadow directionality as you would get with just the main light. It softens the transition areas, creating an almost painter-like atmosphere. But this is only possible if the fill source appears larger in the subject's field of view than the main light. Otherwise, the main light is just going to be blocking the fill light. And if you're ever on set and you're questioning whether or not your light is doing the thing that it's supposed to be doing, just sit in the subject seat and, and take a look. It makes things a lot easier. You'll see right away that maybe you're doing this passive, I mean, on access fill thing and you've got your main light coming in there and then you've got your fill source behind it. Well, if you sit down over here and you look at the main light and you don't see the fill light, then it's not gonna do anything. Well, it might do something. It might bounce off the ceiling and the floor and come back into the shadows, but you really want that to be visible. So you need to either move it closer to the main light and if then it will envelop the outer ring of the main light. It's sort of like a ring light feeling sort of effect. And if that's not physically possible, then you're gonna need a larger fill source in order to accomplish this. So just keep that in mind. If you're photographing a subject with exposed legs, such as a woman with a slit in her dress, I would suggest using a large strip light on camera right or left so that you can get a Rembrandt lighting pattern uh, while also getting a highlight running up and down their entire leg. And then you could place the fill source there behind it and give yourself some nice on access fill. It really uh, doesn't matter if you do it on access with this situation, but it could look good. It's sort of how I figured out the first time I did this, that's how I did it, and it worked out pretty well. So now we're gonna demonstrate active fill. I've got my 100 centimeter deep octa over here, and then I've also got my Elenchrome light motive um, indirect strip box over here. And indirect just means that the light points away from the subject, it bounces around and it comes out and it's very even. It's about 13 by 69 inches. I'll put the real dimensions in metric and imperial down here at the bottom. I can never remember what it is for some reason. But remember the principle of active fill is that we're gonna be able to dial in exactly what we want. So I've got my main light set up here so that the exposure on my face is F8. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn over here to the fill light and I'm going to want that to meter two stops down, which is F4. So we're going to pull this down about two stops because it's a little too bright. And that should be about right. This meter, the Sekonic L478DRUEL, talks to the Elenchrome lights and I can change the power directly from here. So now I've got it set up in that one to four ratio that I was talking about earlier. But first I'm gonna show you what it looks like, again, with no, no fill light whatsoever. And then I'm gonna show it to you with the main light and the fill together. Head straight up and down, great, great. Okay, great, now I'm gonna turn on the fill light so that we can see what that looks like. And here it is all by itself. And you can see it's quite dim. And now you can see what it looks like with both lights firing. All right, so that's what a one to four ratio would look like. Let's go ahead and dial it up half a stop and just see how it looks. That's the great thing about active fill is that we really can dial in anything that we want. One, two, three, four, five. I'll turn it up another half of a stop. All right, and now there's a one to two ratio and there's a lot more detail in the shadows. To illustrate how different fill sources affect an image, let's look at one particular lighting setup and use it as an example. However, you should be able to take the illustrated principles from this test and apply them to other situations. If you're adding fill to a clamshell lighting setup, the fill source you choose can have an effect on the character of your lighting overall. Or you could decide that the main light is fine all on its own, and that's okay. Using a white foam board for fill will add a little detail and soften the shadows just a bit. 
Using a common silver foldable reflector will have more impact and it will create a more pronounced catch light. A 7 inch reflector paired with a light will fill in the shadows in the middle of the face, but it won't change the overall contrast in the image or fill in the shadows farther back on the face. And this could be very desirable if you want to maintain a sense of depth or show off sort of a chiseled bone structure like you see here on this particular model. A one by three foot strip softbox will allow you to fill in the shadows so that they are the exact brightness you want as well. But since it's much wider than the seven inch reflector, the light will wrap around because it, it's wide, it's gonna come into the shadows and it's gonna wrap around and onto the sides of the subject's face. And that's gonna take away some of the structure that you would see if you just use the seven inch. So keep that in mind as well. Regardless of which strategy or brightness you choose to employ when you're using film, the only thing that matters is that you take an active role to produce the image that you are looking for. And you don't just sit back and allow whatever happens to happen. If you guys enjoyed this video, please give me a thumbs up and hit subscribe if you're not already subscribed to the channel. Also, if you're interested in learning more from me, I teach workshops all around the country. Just go to johngress.com workshops. And I also have an online members only website that you can check out as well. It's johngress.com academy. Thank you so much for watching. Stay safe, have a great day, and I'll talk to you soon.